We are following up on the rebuild of the Ampex 6516 amplifier and as you remember the last time it was in uh, stock original shape and since then I have gutted it completely and, and repopulated the insides. Uh, from the insides I took out these uh, nice boards and you see all of the resistors and capacitors were on this board. I removed the capacitors and dumped them. And uh, these are Alan Bradley resistors. Uh, they, they were nice uh, carbon uh, composition resistors. So these can, could be reused for other projects if you want. This thing was in the middle for the on-off switch. This is gone as well. Uh, so now we will be able to use the amp right side up. So transformers up and this will be the bottom. And in the original application this was your faceplate. So what did we do here? Uh, actually this looks very different as uh, compared to the original. If you recall however it's not that different. It's kept pretty much stock. So when we look at the schematics, if you look at the power supply part, uh, there's the 5U4G rectifier and it goes into... So here it, it, it's drawn in a funky way, but that's the C1 filter. So it basically had two uh, 80 microfarad caps in series and each of them were 475 volt rated. So the input capacitor bank is rated to uh, over 900 volts DC. And uh, the operating voltage of this amp for the high voltage is uh, 555 volts DC. So that's pretty high, but why on earth did they use a so high uh, rating? And they did that because as you will see, uh, we will turn on the amp and, and you can see that there is a peak going up to 620 volts at the startup. Or if the line voltage is higher than normal, let's say 123 volts, then it can the startup voltage will rise up to 640 volts. So yes, you need a quite high uh, voltage rated input capacitance. And then this C1 filter, it fed the uh, output transformer directly and on the other side here when we go to C2 the C2 section there was a 6 kilo ohm resistor and that had another 40 uh, microfarad capacitor bank and that fed the phase splitters so what I'm, we are doing here is instead of that C1 so this is our C1 and I kept it at 40 microfarads the same as in the original but I also had added a second capacitor here and at the moment it's a CRC pi filter combination but I'm going to upgrade this resistor into a choke and there's as you can see plenty of space here which is on on this side right here so I can put a choke right there and if I look around I do not have that choke with me but it will be about the size of this transformer. So it will go right in there and it's just a perfect fit for a choke. Um, so then it will have nice uh, uh, choke input filtering and the reason behind that is that this resistor, now that's an 80 ohm resistor and I'm going to put in a, a triad transform uh, choke there and that's a 0.3 Henry choke, so it's relatively low in uh, inductance, but, but it still works much better than an 80 ohm resistor. But the benefit of that choke is that it has, as I said, this small size, which is really tiny for a choke. And it can handle quite high currents, up to 300 milliamps, and it has a DCR only of 10 ohms. And that's really, really a big thing uh, for low-end response. So that will be a, a quite a big upgrade. But at first, I just want to see it, how it works with that. And at the moment, I have only one choke. So 
so that's why I have this right now and I will break this amp nice in nicely and then check out the choke on one channel and and I can see what difference it makes so going further with the schematics so we have looked at the power supply however when you look at the power supply for the face splitter it, it did not just feed the face splitter it also fed the screens of uh, can we see it here yes here that line you see that line goes there to the screens of the 807 tube so the power tubes were uh, were in running a tetrode mode and the screens uh, run at 300 volts so actually this uh, the voltage here feeding uh, uh, the face splitter and the screen was 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 300 watts and the way they they did that is through a 6 kilo ohm drop resistor and there is a 20k resistor going to ground which was pulling 20 milliamps of current and and you would be scratching your head like who would do such a thing and why do they put an extra resistor in here to just have a steady state 20 milliamp current draw why didn't just they put let's say maybe like a 10k resistor there and they still have uh, the same um, voltage drop but then they can spare 20 milliamps of current and when you think about that think about it this way that if, if you can spare even one milliamp of current on your power supply draw that will have a significant impact in the sound you you can hear a significant impact in, in better dynamics so for example here you can see there are two 280 kilo ohm resistors in uh, in parallel with these input capacitors to e equalize the voltage drop across them but they also act as bleeder resistors so once you turn the amp off through these resistors uh, your your high voltage will bleed from the capacitors and I have noticed that what I did in my amps is that I have a bleeder resistor in there but I also have a switch so the bleeders can be switched on or off and uh, if you switch the bleeders off then even though there's like a half a mega ohm resistance or even if you put one mega ohm resistance there uh, uh, you can hear the impact of that one mega ohm being there or not and it's it's quite significant so so that uh, so normally most people put in bleeders there so that when you turn the amp off then uh, your voltage drops to zero and you won't electrocute yourself when you are working with an amplifier however it's a really big compromise in sound i would say not really big but uh, noticeable and once you once you hear it <laughs> you can't unhear it so what i do is i have a resistor load and when you power off the amplifier like here then just connect one end to the ground and connect one end to the high voltage and it will bleed the the remaining line voltage to zero volts and then it's uh, safe to work with so let's come back here and uh, and let's return to this point why on earth they put in there that 20 kilo ohm resistor that pulls 20 milliamps of current and the reason behind that is that this is an ampax amplifier and uh, when you look at other Ampex amps, this is one of their smallest theater amplifier models. They, they intended it for monitor use. So, so like quality checking your movies in, in a sm smaller theater before you release it into a big one. And, uh, and as such, they wanted to make it more compact and uh, and here you see i put these tube sockets in there so you can they they, they left here space for uh, two voltage regulator gas tubes vr tubes and and these tubes are not in this model not in this amplifier but when you look at the bigger ampex amps all of them have vr tubes which are gas tubes i'll show, I'll show you how these look like
so this is a VR tube. Uh, it, it has a has a gas mixture in, mixture inside, and depending on the gas mixture, it uh, regulates to different voltages. So this is an OD3 tube, or VR150, and these regulate uh, the voltage to 150 volts. And and the VR not and the number that tells you what is the regulated voltage. So there's like VR90. VR 135 and so on and so on um, and uh, and all the Ampex designs they use two VR 150 in series to get 300 volts regulated and uh, and and the way these VR tubes work they they pull current through them uh, which is a steady state current and uh, and to get the best out of them meaning uh, good regulation plus long life you need to run them at 20 milliamps, and uh, if if this thing was uh, uh, a VR tube design instead, then in the schematics you just take out that 20k resistor and you put in two VR tubes there. That's the only thing you need to change to turn this into a, a VR regulated design, and you can put the two VR tubes right in between those iron. So when you look at the other channel, you see the VR tubes, where are they? Right there in the back. So, so that's, that's what you can do. However, I noticed that uh, running them just directly with that change, uh, they are not stable because sometimes if the music signal is big, then the input and phase splitter stage draws too much current. So I had to decouple it with an extra RC stage to make it uh, stable. And then if you put a 1K resistor and then an extra capacitor bank, then it will become stable uh, for VR tube use. And uh, let's see, so that the actually you cannot put a capacitor after VR tubes, that's very important because they have negative resistance and you have to DQ them so you have to put a, a bigger resistor in front but I think I will make a video on VR tubes because that's something quite obscure but really beneficial and these power tubes the 807s now they are in the back we can see one right there they the secret for them to have great sound of them is either run them in triode mode or run the screens with VR tubes. If you use this, if you use feed the screens on uh, from uh, like a voltage divider or Zener diodes, you will get a thin, screechy, really ugly, awful sound. But uh, with uh, VR tubes, you will have an extremely dynamic sound. Uh, I would say the 807 with the uh, VR tube regulated screens, that's the most dynamic amplifier I ever heard. And if you run it in triode mode, then you will have uh, less dynamics out of them, but better, I would say like um, more heavy or more relaxed uh, bass, like, like a fuller bass. But that's kind of like a difference in opinions because in in, uh, in the VR mode it, it still has great bass but it, it's a very different type of sound in triode mode versus uh, VR regulated mode so going back to the schematics what did we keep what did we change so I kept the coupling capacitor values the same 0.1 microfarad and put in these obligato premium film caps these are the kilovolt rated obligatos, but you cannot really see because I put uh, copper tape around them. And, and uh, so that's what I did with all of the capacitors, copper tape around them and then grounded those. Where can you see the grounding? Oh, there. You see on the obligatos, you can see that there is a lead soldered onto and the lead is just connected to ground. So that, that, that makes a huge difference for capacitors. It makes them much quieter, so there's no noise pickup because then you, you have them screened. 
So returning to the schematics, here there's like a, a front input stage there. There's an extra gain stage because the, the theater amp used the tape level inputs. So basically you can use this as a guitar amp, just plug in your guitar and phew, good. But if you use it as an audio amplifier, you have to ditch this stage because the gain would be unrealistically high. So instead of that stage, I put in here a, a volume pot. So, so this unit has now a volume control and then you can change your volume input level. And then that goes to, to the input stage, which is kept the exact same as it is shown here. And you see here in the original one, there was a 250k pot as well. <laughs> so, so that stayed, but, but here it's only a 100k pot, not, not a 250. And another thing that I did is I did not include the feedback loop. So this amp is without feedback, no feedback version. And why I did do that, that will be a topic for a different video. So now let's just follow through what else we have. I kept the face splitter the same, uh, except that instead of a common cathode, I split it. So instead of a 1K, uh, there's like a 2.2K uh, resist cathode resistor for each, uh, each sections, it, it, each 6S and 7 sections. And they are, of course, bypassed with capacitance. A little bit higher than here in the original one it's just 10 microfarad for the both of them and here it's 100 microfarad each and those those are the babies there you see those are the cathode bypass caps and they are elna silmic tools which are vastly vastly superior for cathode bypassing than anything else i tried any other electrolytics and, and so as you can see here, one change was that I ditched these uh, uh, boards and in, instead of that, all the resistors are, are direct wired. So I don't, I don't have those junky leads running here and then running back. Instead of all of that, everything is on the tube sockets. And for the capacitors, you see I have mounted them on the chassis. So there is a double-sided 3M tape which holds them into the chassis. Maybe I can find it here. There's a roll of it. So, so this is the thing. That's the 3M double-sided sticky tape. And this is the stuff that holds the huge glass windows onto the skyscrapers. So this is like really durable, really strong, but it also gives a really good damping. So that imagine that as, as your 100 story high building shrinks and expands due to thermal expansion and contraction the those glass windows stay on and then can adapt to the changing uh, metal shape so so i use this in amplification as well so that uh, your capacitor is mounted to the chassis but there is a, a dampening of the chassis vibrations they don't get picked up that much by these capacitors and for the uh, power supply filtering capacitors I use uh, DC link capacitors and DC link technology is, is really new it's it's a polypropylene film technology but it's different from regular polypropylene films uh, in a way that is designed to handle extremely large ripple current and it can handle extreme over voltages and it has extremely long lifespan so this technology was uh, invented for inverter technology so when you have solar panels and you want to make uh, ac from the dc that they produce they use this type of capacitor banks on them and they they handle monster repulse they uh, these caps can handle 150 percent over voltage and these are 500 volts rated and i will show you that they operate at 155 volts in steady state which is like 10 percent over voltage if you would do that with an electrolytic capacitor uh 95 percent of the electric electrolytics would just blow up right away at the first try 
and the rest of the five would blow up <laughs> in the first 10 power-ups. Uh, and uh, as you will see that I have uh, over voltage at turn on that which is above 600 volts with and and that for a average electrolytic that would be a gigantic no no it would make a really big explosion but here uh, with these ceiling caps it's okay to use because they are uh, if you look at the manuals it states that they can handle 150 percent over voltage for 20 seconds without any problem so these are 500 volt rated so 750 volts for 20 30 seconds uh, it it does not de decrease their uh, lifespan which is ridiculously long in the hundred thousand hour range uh, provided it's operated at 70 degrees Celsius and we operate it at much lower than that because the ripple we are subjecting it is, 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 is relatively a joke compared to inverter requirements and uh, also the uh, external temperature in your living room and inside the amplifier chassis it's, it will not go above 45 degrees Celsius while when you use it in a solar panel at the top of the roof it, it can easily go to 80-90 degrees Celsius so we are using them in a very conservative way and in this way it's totally safe to use use a 500 volt rated DC link cap at 550 volts so th that's that's our C1 bank and, uh, and here you can see this is where the high voltage runs to that junction point I used to have the, that uh, 6k resistor uh, which in this amp I modified to a 9k because in the other unit it's a 6k amp and and after the 6k we have the VR tubes and the VR tubes feed the screens these are the screens of the 807s and then we have a resistor 1k resistor and that feeds the capacitor for the phase splitter and then a resistor that feeds the input stage so that's the other unit and it's 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 in that mode so the screens are regulated by VR tubes but here I had problem with VR tubes and uh, no matter what I did the the tubes uh, they 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 would supply 300 watts only for a very short time or intermittently and they would drop down to 240 watts I'm not sure what was going on maybe that's a subject for another video what I did to troubleshoot but I decided that uh, I have very little time to work on these amps uh, so let's just do something something sensible so I converted them into triode mode and uh, that means that I'm dropping the voltage here from line to 300 for the driver stage and for the uh, 807 screens they are connected to so those are the leads that run to the plate cap so they uh, they are connected there to those leads and originally I connected uh, two resistors that add up to 2.7k and I did that because I have a Heathkit W2 that I'm using in almost the same configuration and uh, that one has 500 volts B plus and I used 2K resistor there and it's been perfectly safe and operating without a hitch uh, however here I, I measure these when, uh, when in operation and notice that the screens are basically at 400 545 volts so just a few volts below the plates and I was uh, a little bit worried about that because this the, the screens they they really should not be run at more than 300 volts in triode mode but actually in triode mode they can handle more if you have the resistance but I was wondering if I drop it by another 100 volts actually 120 volts zeners that I put inside here for each of them and then drop the screen or the screen a little lower than the plate it might be better for the operation of the 807 
and it did bring down the uh, the current from um, 40 milliamp per tube to about 32 milliamp per tube so the grid voltage dropped from 50 volts to 39 volts and 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 this voltage is developed through a 1.25k resistance so that that's a, a 25 water a 500 ohm plus a 750 watt uh, caddock and and that's for each of the 807s and they uh, run into a clarostat port so you can uh, that's a 100 ohm port so you can balance the two tubes to have equal plate current through the both of them and now let's uh, turn it on and let's check at the scope whether it was a good idea to put the zeners on or not